Thank you, Brother Bradley. We appreciate those beautiful songs, especially that last song that relates to our lesson this evening. But each and every one, appreciate the good prayer prayed by Brother Jim. And we're thankful for the encouragement of each and every one here. Indeed, um, I think I failed to mention last night about what a sumptuous meal that we had last night. But every meal, tonight, last night, Monday night, and Sunday at dinner time, has been indeed delicious and outstanding. And the fellowship is sweet indeed. And I might say again that I do have a great appreciation for the Lord's Church here at Bellevue, for all the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, the godly the faithful preacher that you have in Brother Hatcher, the godly elders and Brother Stankliff, and Brother Brantley, and each and every member of the congregation. But uh, indeed, we've enjoyed meeting together with these meals and for the worship later each and every night. And I know that this gospel meeting has been, been a blessing to me and my family, and I hope that it will be to the congregation here, to each and every soul that comes to worship and hears the gospel. Now, tonight we are dealing with the burning bush and the church, and uh, we might wonder well, what does the burning bush have to do with the church? And uh, Brother Michael, I don't have any screen up here on the computer, but uh, probably go along without it, but uh, I don't think you've got anything up there. It is. Okay. Let's see where we are, okay. Oh, we've got to go back a little bit. All right, here we go. Resemblances between the burning bush and the church. Uh, one of the good sisters of mealtime a while ago said, well, the church needs to be on fire. Now, she drew one good resemblance right there. We do need to be on fire for the Lord in the Lord's church. How true that is. But this evening, we want to consider the burning bush and the church. It's amazing as we look at these Old Testament passages, the great wealth of knowledge and understanding that we can get in relation to the New Testament and the principles in dealing with God and pleasing Him. As Paul said, the things written aforetime are written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. In Acts chapter 7, verse 30 to 34, we have a portion here of Stephen's sermon before the Jewish council at the end of which he was stoned to death. And we remember that great story. How that he courageously and faithfully preached Christ. And he preached many things about the Old Testament leading up to preaching about the Lord Jesus and his rejection. And part of that sermon is in Acts 7, 30-34, recounting the events of Exodus the third chapter. In verse 30, when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him, that is Moses, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight as he drew near to behold it. The voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. God sees the affliction of his people and he hears their cry. Now, one reason that we need to have gospel meetings is not only to try to convert the lost to Christ or restore the fallen and to build us up and strengthen us, but one way that we are built up is to be encouraged. 
We are living in perilous times in this old world. And we are living in perilous times in the brotherhood. And we can see great encouragement in this passage, in the study about the burning bush. And the Lord said here in Exodus 3, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. God knows our sorrows. And he went on to say to Moses, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land, and a large, unto a land full of milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. We're speaking of the land of Canaan, the promised land. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me. And I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of Israel out of Egypt. God loved His people then. And He loves His people today. We read in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Jesus said in John 14.21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. John 14, 21. The Lord has a special love for those who love him and keep his commandments. The Lord knows and he cares what we go through as his people. Many of us here tonight are Christians. We are children of God. And simply because we are children of God does not mean that we are without suffering in this life. Because we do go through suffering and oppression. Just as they did back then. And the Lord knows and He cares. As Peter said, casting all your care upon Him. For he careth for you. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. In 1 Peter 3 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This is one of the great blessings of the Christian life. In being faithful. In living a righteous and godly life. In living soberly and righteously and godly. Titus 2 verse 12. And that is to know that the Lord is watching over us. That His eyes are over us and His ears are open unto, their, unto our prayers. But then this is a great warning against those who would do evil. That the face of the Lord is against them. In Psalm 34, we read these beautiful words. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth. And delivered them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Indeed these are true words. The Lord delivers his people. He hears their cry. He sees their troubles and their sorrows. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But there are other ways that we suffer. And the Lord knows and He sees and He cares. And He hears our cry. God speaks to Moses from the burning bush. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. We read here in Exodus chapter 3. The very fact that God would choose to appear to Moses and commission him to go down into Egypt and to deliver his people with a high hand out of Egyptian bondage shows the Lord's care and concern. When I had the opportunity to be in Jerusalem back in December of 1999, one day our Jewish tour guide took us to the Holocaust Museum which of course was about the destruction of many of the Jews during the Nazi and the World War II period. And outside the Holocaust Museum there was an iron statue of an old man bent over hiding his eyes. And the tour guide said that represents God. The Jewish people he said, feel that God has hidden his eyes from them as if he does not see or care. Of course, that's false. No, God does care. But what the Jewish people need to realize is if they would be accepted of God, they must believe on and obey his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. But now going on in the text here, God speaks to Moses from the bush. We see that God can use that which seems worthless and insignificant. Here, a burning bush on the backside of the desert. Who would think of such a thing? Man would not. But God used that bush. A bush in the desert may seem worthless and insignificant. The church seems small, insignificant, and worthless to many people. Even men such as Rubel Shelley bemoaned the Lord's church as we know it as being an insignificance. What a shame. But it is not. To God, the church is of great importance. As we have seen, He loved the church. Christ did and gave Himself for it. Acts 20, 28 speaks of the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. In Luke 16, Jesus said, For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Many of those things that men seem uh, look upon and esteem as great, are an abomination in God's eyes. But the contrast is true. Many things that God esteems highly, man looks down on. The church should not be derided, but honored. God symbolizes the local congregation of the Lord's people in Revelation 1 as a golden candlestick purpose of a candlestick or lampstand being to uphold the light and gold being the most precious metal known to man. And the church is of such significance, the local church, that it finds its place in the eternal holy writ as we read of the churches of Christ. Salute you in Romans 16, 16. Through the church, God is glorified. Of the many great organizations and bodies throughout the world esteemed highly by men. In none of them does God receive the glory, except in the church of the Lord, which many disdain. Paul said unto him, Be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. We see that God can use those who seem to be insignificant. Jesus said, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Many on this earth who seem to be in first place, a place of prominence, 
when the judgment comes and eternity rolls around, they'll be in last place then. Think about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Both of them died. You know, death is a great equalizer, isn't it? Equalizer in the sense, not that all men are going to be equal in eternity. Some are going to be lost. Some are going to be saved. But in the sense that regardless of the power, influence, or money we may have had on this earth, that's not going to change where we are in eternity. The rich man ended up being in torments while Lazarus the beggar was in Abraham's bosom. And Abraham said of him, Now he is comforted, and thou art tormented to the rich man. Over in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, Paul speaks of the fact that God does not need those prominent and powerful of this world to do His work. In fact, not many of them are going to receive the calling of God through the gospel. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised. If God chosen, yea, and things which are not, bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. We know that God chooses those who are humble and willingly obedient to His will. Whoever is willing to submit to the will of God, regardless of his station in life, whether high or low, God can use that person and does. Jesus said, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 23 and verse 12. And humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. James 4 and verse 10. Also in the book of James, the second chapter, in verse number 5, we remember how that James said, Hearken, my beloved brethren, if not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which He hath promised to them that love Him, the late gospel preacher, Brother Andrew Connolly, told the story of in the work in Tanzania, Africa, in the school they had there, they had an old African, and I say old, he was an older brother, gentleman, Brother Sam John. Brother John could neither read nor write, he was illiterate. And one of the prerequisites they had to enter the school was, one had to be able to read and write. But this old brother, he, he thought he was probably in the 70s. He didn't have a birth certificate. He could do neither, but they made an exception with him. And he enrolled in the school, and after they'd gone to school for some months, it came time for the winter holidays. Brother John went home to his home village back in the bush country. And when the students came back to school after the break, they returned, but Brother Sam John was not with them. So they got up a group and went back to his home village. And they looked but could not find Brother Sam John. But they did find something else. They found the church of the Lord that he had established before he died. Here was an older man, uneducated, just learning to preach, illiterate. He did something which most people will never do, even in the church. He established a congregation of the Lord's people. Someone has said that God is not, not so much as concerned with our ability as our availability. And oh, how true that is. Are we making ourselves available in the cause and work of Jesus Christ? As Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, 
unmovable, always abiding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But now the bush and the desert is like the church and the world in other ways. Let's think about it. There was no other bush like it in all the desert. It stood out. It was burning. It was on fire, but it was not being consumed. But it was unique. There is nothing in all the world like the Lord's church. It is unique and distinctive. That's one of the great lessons we can get from the burning bush. We should not be like some who are ashamed of the difference and distinctiveness of the church of our Lord. But we should be honored to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ, which is distinctive and is different. It stands out John said, We are of God in the whole world, life and wickedness. 1 John 5, verse 19. The church of our Lord is distinctive. It is God's peculiar people made up of a people for God's own possession. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Not obtain mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And then over in the book of Philippians, in the second chapter, verses 15 and 16, Paul says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Indeed, Christians shine as lights in the midst of a world of darkness. Indeed, we are to be that light. But if we lose our distinctiveness, if the salt loses the supper, then we no longer do belong to Jesus Christ. He said, Ye are the salt of the world. But if the salt loses its savor, what good is it? What did Jesus say about that in Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse number 13? He said, But if the salt, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. If we lose that savor, that distinctiveness, that Christ likeness, then what good are we as members of the church? He went on to say, You're the light of the world. And then in verse 16, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The only way, beloved, that we can lose our savor and distinctiveness is if we cease to continue in the word of Christ. Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That is truly. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verse 31 and 32. But yet there are many in the church who want to become like the denominations in the world. Like those back there in the days of Samuel, prophet and priest of Israel, who said to him, Give us a king like the nations. We want, in other words, we want to be like the nations around about us. And God told Samuel, He said, They have not rejected you. But they have rejected me that I should not be king over them. And we need to understand today 
There's godly elders and preachers and other members of the church who stand for the truth. That when people reject us because we stand for the truth, and when they reject our message, they are actually rejecting the Lord. That's who they're rejecting. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, that the one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. And James said that friendship with the world is enmity with God. James 4, verse 4. And that if any man love the world, John said, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2 teaches us. And so when people strive to be like the world, and claim to be Christians, actually, they don't have the love for God in them that they once had or that they should have. But then we notice regarding the burning bush that the place was holy ground. In Exodus 3 and 5 and Acts 7 33 that we read, the place was holy because of the presence of God Almighty. Then said the Lord to him, To Moses, put off thy shoes from thy feet. For the place where thou standest is holy ground. Acts 7, verse 33. Does this, beloved, not remind us of the church? That the church is holy. It is a spiritual house according to 1 Peter 2, 5, that we are a holy nation, that we are a royal priesthood, that we are a holy people, that the Lord desires for His church, the body of Christ, as we read in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, that it should be holy and without blemish. Many are profane because they treat that which is sacred or holy as common, such as the church. And this is the idea behind the expression profanity. When, you, when one uses profanity, he is taking the sacred and high and holy name of God and using it as something common. And so today when people throw the Lord's name around in the name of Jesus Christ or the name of God in their everyday language and they do not mean by this to render praise or honor to God or to teach about God, they're simply using it as an expression or a byword. They are treating that which is sacred and hallowed and holy as something common. And this makes them profane people. And this is the idea of profanity. Like Esau, he was a profane person and a fornicator. Hebrews 12, 16. But now, moreover, what about people today in the church of our Lord? Among our brethren, and preachers and teachers in colleges and preacher schools, who are treating the church of our Lord as something common and not something holy and sacred. The church is, if you please, holy ground. No man has a right to put his unholy hand on it and to try to change the Lord's church from that New Testament pattern. As we are to hold fast the form or pattern of sound words, 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. Oh, we wouldn't want to be the man in the day of judgment that brought error and sinful division into the body of Christ to rend the beautiful bride of Christ asunder and to bring upon her spot and blemish by worldliness, immorality, ungodliness, or false teaching, and trying to have our way rather than God having His way. But now holiness is the idea of separation for a special purpose. The Christian is separated unto God for His high and holy purposes. And thus we are told that we are to be holy in 1 Peter 1.16. 
And in Romans 12, when I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And thus we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. We are to be holy and acceptable unto Him, not unto men. We are to live holy lives. I like to read this quote by Brother Guy in Woods in his excellent commentary on First uh, Peter. He said, The design of God's calling is holiness. The sanctification of the whole life to Him, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication. For God called us not for uncleanness, but in sanctification. And he references 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 and 7. It goes on to say, This holiness to which all are called is essentially separation from a life of habitual sin and all worldly defilement. Such is the meaning of the word translated holiness from hagios in the Greek. The word sanctify, sanctification, saint, holy, and holiness all derive from the same, this same root and thus bear related meanings. Here God as a perfect pattern of holiness is set forth for our emulation in all manner of living. End of quote. And it's important for us as Bible students to understand that connection between those words. To be sanctified, sanctification, to be a saint and holy. And to live in holiness, derived from the same root, the meaning of Hagios. And the idea is that we as saints, as a sanctified people, sanctified by the word of God, John 17, verse 17, are separated and set apart unto God and for God, unto his high and holy purposes. God's people are to be holy in their thinking, dress, speech, attitude, affections, and all manner of life. Today, when you go throughout the brotherhood and you see in the Lord's church the way some members of the church dress, you can't really tell any difference between them and a child of the world. And they, they dress so immodestly. And the way you hear some members of the church talk in their everyday life when they go to work or in their everyday speech, it's just the same worldly talk and language that people of the world use. When we see the attitude that some so-called Christians have toward their fellow man and toward life in general, it's not holy. It's not spiritual. It's not Christ-like. Their way of life is not really distinct from the world. So rather than becoming like Christ, they are still like the world. The Apostle Peter said to be ye holy for I am holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 16. And then over there in 2 Corinthians the 6th chapter. Paul in that passage gives us the idea of holiness. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Verses 17 and 18. And then in chapter 7 and verse 1, he said that we are to perfect holiness in the fear of God, that is, in reverence of God. But then we notice regarding the bush that God's message of deliverance was proclaimed from the book. From the bush, God announced His plans to Moses there in Exodus chapter 3 and in Acts chapter 7, as Stephen referred to it. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land, he said in verse 7. From the church, God's message of deliverance is to be proclaimed. Let us not fail in our God-given mission. As the church... 
of God is the house. The house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church is that institution that God has established to uphold, to advance, to preach, to teach, and defend the truth of His holy word. As He said to His disciples, to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Paul speaks of the fact that he preached the unsearchable riches of Christ in Ephesians 3.8. Indeed, we as the church of our Lord are to declare that glorious message. One gospel preacher said there are two things that the church must realize. Number one, the world is lost without the gospel. And number two, we are going to be lost if we don't take the gospel to the world. A greater deliverance are we to announce even than that from Egyptian bondage. God delivering sinful man from the power of darkness is a much greater deliverance than that from Egyptian bondage. As we read in Colossians 1, beginning at verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. We could not escape the power of darkness and the clutch of Satan, who is a roaring lion, goeth about, seeking him be made of our first Peter 5, 8, without Christ and the gospel. The gospel of Christ, the power of God, and to salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first, and also the Greek, Romans 1, 16. Deliverance by the Savior and through His precious blood is the deliverance that we're speaking of. When God delivered the people out of Egypt, they were to put blood, the Lamb's blood, on the doorposts and the lintel of the house. And God said there in Exodus 12, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That was a great deliverance. But we are able to enjoy deliverance from sin and death by a greater sacrifice than that of the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. And we are blessed to be a part of a house greater than a house in Egypt with the Lamb's blood on it. We are blessed to be in the house of God, purchased by the precious blood of Christ as a Lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1, 19. To a greater place than Canaan's land, that is, earthly Canaan, the heaven itself. Oh, what a great and wonderful place that's going to be. When you think about heaven there in Revelation 21, and we'll not read the whole passage, but think about what John said there in verse number 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will be with them, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's the main motivation for going to heaven right there. Of all the grand and glorious things that John spoke of, symbolizing the heaven, the gates of pearl, the streets of gold, the river of glass, and all these things, the walls of Jasper, the main motive is to go and be with God. As Paul said, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ which is far better, Philippians 1, 23. But then you think about the things that will not be in heaven. In verse number 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. No more death, no more doctor bills, no more pills, no more hospitals, no more sickness, no more crying. We will be in a place where there will be no sin and no trouble at all when we get to heaven. The burning bush was not consumed. Think about that. This caught the attention of Moses, as we have read earlier. The world stands in dismay that the church has not already been destroyed. Like the burning bush being unconsumed, 
The church of Christ is imperishable. It cannot be destroyed. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. The church is that kingdom predicted by Daniel in Daniel 2, verse 44, that the God of heaven would set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The old ship of Zion has sailed through many bloody seas, but it continues on. We read of the persecuted saints in Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him, that is, the devil, the serpent. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Indeed, when one comes into the church of Christ, he becomes a part of that which is eternal. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 12, verse 28. Yet this cannot be said of Roman Catholicism, of Islam, of the denominations, or all or any other religious body. For Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. In Matthew 15, Verse 13, all these other religions have not been established by God, but by man. But only the church of our Lord was established by God. God was in the midst of the bush. God identified himself as the one who spoke to Moses from the bush. God is amidst the church today. Before we close here momentarily, look at what he said in Hebrews 2, verse 11 and 12. I wonder how many members of the church are even aware of this passage regarding the Christ. And of course, verse 12 is from Psalm 22. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare, declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. It is not a marvelous thought that the Lord is amongst and amidst his people. As the Lord was in the midst of the churches of Christ in ancient Asia, the seven churches of Asia, so is he in the midst of his people today. I would like to read Revelation 2 and verse number 1. And see if this does not help and encourage us to read and to know this. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That is, the Lord is walking amongst and amidst the churches of Christ. God dwells in the church, his temple today. It is spoken of there in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 in Ephesians chapter 2. What a great thing. God is with his children. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear when man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. What a great thing to know that God is with us and that He is for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. This should also produce awe in our hearts. As He said to every one of those seven churches of Asia, in chapters 2 and 3, I know thy works. He said it seven times. Chapter 2, verses 2, 9, 13, and 19. In chapter 3, verses 1, 8, and 15. He who has eyes as of a flame of fire. Chapter 1, verse 14. He said, I know thy works. And he can say that today about the congregation here. And each and every member thereof. Indeed, the Lord is with his people. My friend, tonight are you a part of that which cannot be destroyed. 
the church of Christ. If we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we will come into Christ and into His body, the church. If we hear and believe the word of the kingdom, the gospel, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. It is the power of God to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That is the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16. Believing we must repent and turn to God, Acts 26, 20. To confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And then be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins, Matthew 28, 19, and Acts 2, 38. This will put you into Christ and into His body. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27 For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12.13 We read how that the Samaritans, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 8, 12. They believed what he preached regarding the name of Christ and his authority, regarding the plan of salvation, and regarding the Lord's church, the kingdom of God. You know, uh, I heard or read a story several years ago about a preacher who labored to convert a young 15-year-old boy to Christ. One Sunday night, 7.45, the young man was baptized into Christ and was saved and added by the Lord of the church. By noon the next day, the boy had lost his life in a tractor accident. And the mother called that preacher to do the funeral. And she asked the preacher a question. He said, what if he had waited a week later, one week later? Oh, what a difference time makes. My beloved friend, young or old, if you need to obey the gospel, why not obey tonight? If you need to, as a child of God, to repent and pray God's forgiveness, Acts 8, 22, why not come and make things right tonight? Now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Call on the name of the Lord. If you need to obey the gospel, or if you need to be restored, please come as we stand and we sing.